All right, so both of my sermons today are, are kind of dealing with a, with a similar topic. Obviously, with the events that just happened, it's something that needs to be dealt with, and, and, and I want to make sure that we're clear on the instructions here. If you weren't here this morning, I recommend listening to the sermon this morning. I don't think I ever gave the sermon title. The sermon title this morning was Perilous Times Ahead, Don't Break Rank. Okay, and, and, and obviously there's a lot of, you know, uh, the reason why I chose that title is because it, it's important for a church that's, that's doing the work, right? There's a lot of churches out there. There's a lot of churches that are just social clubs. There's a lot of churches that just show up to maybe get a pat on the back, get an attaboy, good job, you know, some type of uplifting, one little verse read, and just go about your lives and don't actually do anything for God and don't change the way you live and just come in and go in the same and leave the same and just be just like the world. Okay, that's not who we are here. And that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're trying to actually serve the Lord and, and, you know, live our lives by the scripture. And, and, and the church is a church family. And we're, we're doing things together as a group. All of us are involved. Okay, we all have a, a place. We all have a job. We all have a duty to, to serve the Lord with Jesus Christ as our head. Jesus Christ is the head of this local church, which is why everything that we do, we strive our best to be done according to Scripture. Every single aspect, the whole point is we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to go to God's Word and do, and, and everything that we do and everything that we believe is going to come straight from here. The way that we run the service, all that we do, the soul winning that we do, we preach the gospel, the songs that we sing, everything that we do, we try our best to do according to the way that the scripture commands us to do. Okay? And not just in church, we're a group of people that actually believe that the word of God is, is not bound by Sunday morning. Right? This isn't something that we come in and talk about or think about one morning a week. It's something that we strive to make part of our lives every single day. That we can have a good relationship with our Heavenly Father. That we can live every day of our life striving more and more to get rid of sin and striving more and more to serve the Lord and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. And, and to walk the path that He is laying out for us and understand what that path is and to have that light shine down on our path so that we can walk the way that He would have us to walk and take it seriously and really invest in the Word of God and in serving the Lord. That's what this church is all about. Okay? Now, a lot of things go along with the Christian life and the Christian walk. And, and I'm not going to re-preach this morning's sermon, but God has called us to be soldiers of Jesus Christ. Okay, and there's a lot of analogies, there's a lot of symbolism that God uses to help us to understand how we need to live and how we need to walk. Okay, it's not just being a soldier, right? You can only take that analogy so far. And I mentioned this this morning, the, the weapons of our warfare are spiritual, they're not carnal. We're not in a physical battle. So while, yes, there's a church of friends of ours, of brothers and sisters in Christ that got bombed, we're not talking about, okay, now we got to get our guns in and count our ammo and start making you know, bombs and do all this because we're going to counterattack. That's not it at all, right? That's, that's, if that goes through your mind, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> you got to get your mind right, okay? That's not what, what I'm talking about. And I want to stress that because while, yes, it is a battle, and yes, people may try to physically assault you and persecute you just as they did the disciples. They cast them in prison. They were beaten. They, they, were, they were mocked. They were ridiculed. They had all kinds of forms of persecution against them. We need to be able to expect the same. But what's important, though, for our church, since we have a whole body here trying to do a great work for the Lord, we need to stay together. We need to be involved. We need to be here and, and just involved with one another Right? Encouraging and edifying and being there for each other, especially, excuse me, during these hard times. And not even just the local body, but being able to care for other saints and other workers and other soldiers that are, that are doing their job. And again, you could, you could listen to this whole morning sermon. You know, not breaking rank is important. And if you look at it from, you know, a, a military perspective, the way that the Bible even calls us to be soldiers for, look, I'm not just making this up, right? The Bible says that we're soldiers for Jesus Christ, okay? This isn't something that I just came up with this thought on my own. 
and it's there for a reason because there's a battle going on. There's a spiritual battle. And we're told to, to put on the armor of God. And, and, and the Bible tells us what all of that is. But the reason why it's important not to break rank is because when you're involved in a battle, when you're involved in a fight, you, know, you need to have your defenses up. You need to be working together because that's going to be the most effective. You're going to have the most force and, and get the most done or, or at least be the most defended when people aren't turning and running, you know, tucking tail and running and, and, and retreating and fleeing. We need to maintain the strength for the, the, you know, the progress that we've made to this point and not be overrun by the, by the wicked people out in the world they are going to try to make you afraid. Okay, and we need each other because when events like that happen, look, it's scary. I'm not going to stand up here and say it's not. And there's a reason that people can become fearful. I understand that. But the Bible commands us not to be afraid. Again, I've I mentioned all that this, in this morning's sermon on why we don't have to be afraid, why we don't have to be fearful, but we do need to stay together. So in light of this morning's sermon, I want to go a little bit more in depth on what can we do. Because right now, we're not on the front line, as it were. Other brothers and sisters are on the front line. We need to be part of that supply chain for them. We need to be supporting them. We need to be, you know, bringing up the rear, as it were, and being able to support them with whatever they need, whether it be, you know, the, the physical supplies, right? If they need any, any type of, um, you know, anything to help them in their supply, you know, because they need a building now to meet at because their building got, got ruined. Um, it's a crime scene. You know, they're not allowed to just go in there and, and use it. Um, so if they, if they need money to do that, obviously it takes money to, to, to rent out a space and, and meet and everything. You know, we're going to be here to help them for that. But not even just that. And what I want to focus on tonight is being a prayer warrior, right? We're soldiers for Christ. And one of the ways, if you're wondering like, yeah, I mean, this all sounds great. I'm with it. I want to get involved. I want to do something. I want to help. What can I do? What can I do? Now, I mentioned this morning, hey, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're going to keep soul winning. We're going to keep preaching to God. We're going to keep doing these things. But one of the things that's very important, and, and I think, unfortunately, too many Christians underestimate, is the power of prayer and seeking the Lord and going to the Lord, especially when you have battles, especially when battles come up, is seeking counsel of the Lord. I mean, you can read through the Old Testament and see through the book of the Kings and Chronicles, and you can see well, when they don't seek the counsel of the Lord, Things don't go that well for them. But when they're seeking God's counsel, when they're going to the Lord and saying, okay, God, what do we do here? What do we go here? Their way is being illuminated by God on what they ought to be doing and what's right and what's not right. And they're going to find success. Now, we started reading in Judges chapter 20 because I think it applies perfectly with what's going on since it's the Sodomites that, are trying, that have been on the attack with the church in El Monte and what we have in Judges 20 is the result of the response of the children of Israel, of God's people, to a horrible event that happened in Judges 19. And I made mention to that this morning, but if you forget what Judges 19 is about, it's the story where the man and his concubine went in and stayed in Israel. It's like, I don't want to stay among the heathen, right? I'm going to stay among God's people. I'm going to stay among Israel. I'm not going to go out to the heathen. I want at least, if I'm going to stay somewhere for the night, I at least want to be among God's people. And he goes into this town and, and one guy was, was actually hospitable. No one wanted to take him in. They were just going to stay in the street because the people there were wicked and didn't even, weren't even willing to, to take in a stranger that needed to be lodged for a night. And the guy's like, look, I, I don't need anything. I just need a place to sleep. I've got all my own food. I've got water. I've got everything I need. I just need somewhere to stay for the night. One guy lets them in. And then before you know it, the children of the devil, the sodomites are surrounding the place, banging on the door, saying, bring that guy out to us because they wanted to defile him. They wanted to hurt him. They wanted to know him just like the Sodomites did in Genesis 19. And they end up, you know, taking the guy's concubine because the people, the, the man and, his, and, and, you know, the man he was staying with and this guy, they were afraid because these people were fierce because they were, they were you know, they were there to do wicked things. 
And they didn't know what to do. Now, obviously, giving a person to appease them was not righteous. That was not godly. They shouldn't have done that, but they did that. That's what happened. That's what happened in the story, and we see how vile and, and, and depraved the children of the devil were that ended up abusing this woman all night until she died. I mean, abusing her to death. It's a horrible story. I, I, I don't like the story at all. I don't even like thinking about it or recalling it or talking about it because it's, it's, it's so wicked and so bad. But you know what? It's in the Bible for a reason. It's in the Bible for a reason. And, and you know what? It's kind of a shocking story, but there's some shocking things that happen in this world. There's some really, really horrible things that people do, and we need to be aware of that. And we need to be aware of who the type of people are that do these things. And over and over again, I proved that this morning, it's the sodomites that do these types of things. I'm not saying it's just them exclusively and no one else can do a horrible thing, but that's who it was in this story. They were looking for the man to abuse all night. They settled for the woman, but they wanted the man. Just like they wanted uh, Lot's friends that came in in Sodom, they were looking for the men to abuse. And this is the men looking to abuse the men. It's wicked, it's sick, it's perverted. That's what they were trying to do. Okay? So in the story, though, in Judges, this is the response. After that happened, this guy then ends up, you know, well, I'm not even, even going to get into what he does. He sends off these messages to the, to the rest of the children. They say, what are we going to do about this? Right? What are we going to do? So as we look at their response, obviously they go and fight a physical battle. But what I want to focus on this evening is the prayer, the seeking God and seeking his advice and going to God with our needs and our cares and our concerns, especially in a time like this. Look at verse number three in Judges chapter 20. The Bible says, Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpeh. Then said the children of Israel, Tell us, how was this wickedness? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belonged to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine, they have forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. So you can see right there what he did. He cuts her up, sends her off, just so that people, you know, I think he did that, just so people could understand this literally happened, right? It's one thing to read about things, it's another thing to see it. And he's just sending this off going, look, this is what happened. What are we going to do about this? And yeah, it's shocking, but when you just read about things, there's, there's not the same impact as when you actually see it. Yeah. And I think that's what he's trying to do here is to shake up the people and be like, look, are we going to tolerate this? This literally happened. This physically happened. What are we going to do? Verse number seven says, Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent Neither will we, any of us, turn into his house. Now, this, is, this ought to be the response to such wicked people doing wicked things, is that, hey, let's all gather together as one person and stamp out this wickedness and say, we will not tolerate this at all. We will not tolerate this lewdness. We will not tolerate this behavior. We're not going to tolerate these perverts just forcing people and bringing this kind of violence upon people because they're just wicked and depraved. We're not going to tolerate it. We're all going to come together as one man and take care of this. That's the response. And you know what? That ought to be the response. And that's how every Christian ought to be saying today is, you know what? We're not going to tolerate this. We're not going to let these wicked people come in and start throwing bombs at churches because you don't like the word of God who are already depraved in doing the depraved acts that the people of the Benjamin were doing in Judges 19. So they all come together as one man. It says, um, verse number 9, But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. And we'll take ten men of an hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel and an hundred of a thousand and a thousand of ten thousand to fetch victual for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So all the men of Israel gathered against the city, knit together as one man. See, the question here isn't, should we do something about this? So, well, I don't know. Should we do anything? 
no, of course you need to do something about it. The question is, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Right. And hopefully, I can answer that tonight. For us as a church, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Amen. Okay? And I mentioned before, we're not going to take up arms because that's not the answer. It's not what God has called us to do at all. Let's jump down to verse number 18. The Bible says, And the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. So now they're, you know, they're deciding what they're going to do, but then they seek God's help and they seek God's advice and say, You know what? We know we're in this battle. We know we're in this fight. Who do you want going first, God? How should, we uh, how should we attack this? How should we approach this? And this is what we need to do with prayer unto God. But here's the thing. In these days and in this time, there was more response from God as, as God's word was being given unto his people, right, through the prophets. And they were literally getting the word of God from man. We don't, ha we don't do that now. That we still pray to God. But here's the thing. When God speaks to us, he's already spoken. Okay? Now, we ask for things, and of course God's powerful to do things. We're going to ask God to help us out and to do things, and we're going to ask God to do things according to his will. Things that we know that God is already for. Things that we know that God would have no reason not to answer our prayers. But we're going to ask God to step in and help us in these areas. We know that God wants to protect his people. We know that God wants the lost to get saved. We know that God wants people just boldly proclaiming his word. We know that. So we want God to protect the people who are doing those things. And God is capable of doing that. So we're going we're gonna to ask God. Well, God's capable of doing anything, obviously. But we're going to ask God to help in areas where we may not be able to physically go out there. So when we go out in prayer to God, you know, we're going to pray for things like, you know, there's angels that God has working for him that are ministering spirits that are meant to be ministers unto us. And I preached an entire sermon on angels before, but you could find that in Scripture. We pray to God that He would send angels to protect that church out there. If we can't physically go over there and help them and be there for them and support and just even just show the numbers and show support, well, we could pray that God will send some angels down there to protect those people. And we're going to get into later the actual you know, meaning of prayer and that it, it is useful and that God does listen to us and will take action because of our prayers. And that we can't just assume that things are just automatically going to happen without us asking. Just as much as you can't just assume that people are just going to get saved without them calling on the name of the Lord. You ask for that gift. Now what happens in this battle, of course, so they went and they did everything right. They all came together as one man. They're all unified. It's a righteous battle, right? They sought counsel of the Lord, but then they lose that first battle, right? There's a whole bunch of people ended up dying. So they suffer a loss, and what do they do? They check with God again. It's a wise choice. They go back to the Lord and seek counsel of the Lord again. Look at verse number 21. The Bible reads, And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day, 20 and 2,000. That's a significant amount of people that died, 22,000 people. That's a big deal. That's a huge loss from the children of Israel. Verse 22 says, And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. So notice, they didn't just tuck tail and run and they didn't just quit. They didn't break rank here. They said, okay, well, we, we suffered a loss, but we're going to go back at this again. They were resolved not to quit. Because look, this is, this is a very important battle. If they quit, what's that saying? Well, I guess it doesn't matter what the, what the Benjamites did, what the, what the children of Belial did in that town to that person when they just defiled that person and forced her all night until she died. I guess it doesn't matter, right? No, some battles and some fights are important to stay in it at all costs. That this will not be tolerated. And you know what? Even if we have heavy losses, we're going to keep fighting. And this is exactly the type of battle that it is. And look, they may have lost the battle. And then they lose the second battle, but you know what? They didn't lose the war. 
they still came out victorious. And we need to understand that too, that there's going to be small battles that you may think like, oh man, they're winning or whatever. But there's a bigger picture here. That even in spite of... look, People can, people can look at Jesus Christ as a failure. Right? And have you ever heard of, you know, the Jews are, are a big group of people that do this? So they call Jesus a failed Messiah? I mean, it's blasphemous. It's because they just don't understand. They think like, oh, well, yeah, he's supposed to be some great Messiah and supposed to do all this stuff. And they ended, he ended up being put to death. Right? Well, what, what, how is that a Messiah? How is that a Savior? And they could look at that and mock that and say, yeah, he failed. And not even realize, no, through his sacrificial death, he brought in the victory. He brought in the victory for all of us. He paid for our sins and he conquered death and hell through the resurrection. Of course it's victorious, but a lot of people can look at that and say they don't understand the impact. They don't understand the end game. They don't understand the importance of that so-called loss that needed to happen, the shame that he needed to suffer, the, the death that he needed to face on the cross in order to bring that victory. And in battles and in wars, you may suffer loss, but we still keep fighting unto the end because if you quit, you've lost for sure. I mean, there is no chance of winning when you quit. But if you stay faithful to the end, God will bring the victory. And that's the, th you know, the thing with, with the spiritual battles. We're trusting in the Lord to bring us victory anyways. We can't go out in the battle in our own strength, under our own power to do our own fighting. You're going to fail if that's all you're relying on. We need to be relying on the power of God. So if we're trusting in the Lord to be our deliverer, to be the one fighting the battles for us, we need to be able to go to him in prayer and then we need to trust in him even when it seems like, you know, things aren't working out for us. And things don't seem to be like, man, man these people, all these people died. Well, go back to God and, and just say, hey, I mean, like, are we doing something wrong? Do we need to do something different, Lord? Did I not understand you? Did I not get it the first time? We want to keep doing this, but you seek the Lord still. They don't just forsake and say, oh, well, forget this then. Verse 22 says, And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves again in array at the first day. Verse 23, And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even, and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. So God's still saying, No, this is right. Fight the fight. Fight the battle. Go up against him. And then they have suffering a second loss. And even though you're fighting the right battle, and it's definitely God's will, I mean, you're hearing from the Lord, no, go up and fight against them. It doesn't mean you're never going to suffer loss. And I was trying to explain this earlier this morning after service that, you know, we have so much confidence in the Lord, and, and we should. Absolutely. And we trust that God will keep us from evil and that God can see us through. But you know what? God never promises that you're not going to suffer anything bad in this world. I mean, over and over again, we're talked about, you know, the Bible it warns us of the persecutions and the trials and tribulations that you're going to face. So he, he could keep us alive, but he's not saying that nothing bad or uncomfortable is ever going to happen to you. So we need to make sure that we don't have, because, you know, many of us have just enjoyed a life for a long time that you haven't really faced serious persecution. Don't get the warped mindset of just thinking that, well, it's never going to come then. Yeah. Look at all of God's prophets. Look at all the people of God that he used mightily and what they went through. Because they all suffered. Yeah. And when I say they suffered, I mean, many of them suffered Pretty bad. I mean, look, at, look at Ezekiel. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in his dungeon and he's in this just, you know, muddy mess and just sitting in that murk and being barely fed and barely kept alive and, you know, has to be pulled out. Of the like, that's not, 
that's, that's some persecution. Okay, that, and that's not pleasant at all. It's very uncomfortable. Look at what the apostles went through. Being beaten and imprisoned. Okay, that's not enjoyable at all. And that's something that, you know, to this point, to my knowledge, no one in here has ever faced anything like that before. And praise God that we've been enjoying peace. But the more we do and the more work that we're being done, the children of the devil are not going to like it and they will come and persecute. But we still need to maintain our faith in the Lord because, again, under the power of God, we have no reason to fear. We may end up experiencing, you know, some a lot of uncomfortable things. But see, just like the Apostle Paul said, he goes down this whole list of all these things he's been through. But then he says, yet out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen. Now, God was with him the whole time. He allowed him to go through some very uncomfortable situations, but he maintained the faith and God saw him through all the way. So he didn't just die and was done. I mean, even when he was stoned, he was stoned like three times. God still kept him. I mean, that's some serious persecution. Yeah. And I'm not saying we're necessarily going to face everything that Paul faced. I mean, I hope not. I don't want to go through all of that stuff. Nobody in their right mind really wants to go through those things, right? But the point is we need to stay faithful to the Lord. And you know what? There's fights and there's battles where that's worth it. You stay in it because it's the right fight. It's the right battle. And even suffering these losses like the children of Israel were suffering, you know what? God's not promising you're never going to suffer loss. But he wants you to stay faithful to him. We need to be prepared to stay in the fight. Even when things get really bad, stay in the fight. It's worth it. This is a fight that you have to be resolved to see unto the end. There's no, there's no backing down. Jump down to verse number 25. The Bible says, And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came into the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? So they go and ask the question. Again, I mean, they're doing all the right things. This is, this is how you know, we could learn from this. They're fighting the fight. Things don't go well. Let's check back with God. Okay, God's saying to go and fight, so we're going to fight. Okay, things still aren't going well. Well, did we do something wrong? Because here's the other thing. Sometimes things go wrong, and it's not because, you know, God's necessarily allowing it to happen for whatever reason. It's that you have an Achan in the, cr in the, in the crowd, right? You remember when um, Achan had this sin, and he took of the accursed thing, and that brought, you know, a problem on all the children of Israel. Yeah. Because he is bringing a curse on everybody. Yeah. So that's why, and, and you know what? When they then, when, uh, when Joshua then fell on his face before the Lord, just like the people are doing here, God's saying like, why are you on your face? You know, and, and he tells them, hey, the people have took of the accursed thing. That's why I'm not with you. So you still go back to God and seek what's, you know, what's going on here. And you do, we do that through prayer. That's how we communicate with God. That's how we're going to seek God and we're going to get in his word to make sure that we understand his will so that we're not doing something outside of his will like Achan was doing, right? That we're not partaker in any of these things. And when the fight comes, you know, you better make sure that you're ready, that you're not harboring your secret sins and, and you know, just, just in some wickedness and be that Achan that's going to, you know, cause the defenses to come down. Because you're not, you're not, um, because you're in some kind of wickedness. But let's, um, let's keep reading here. So they go to God. They say, well, you know, should I cease? And the Lord said, go up for tomorrow. I will deliver them into thine hand. Of course, that's what happened. They get the victory. And um, I think, you know, one of the reasons God might be doing this is to show them, you know, this is important and you need to fight through. And yeah, there may be some losses, 
But in order to see the victory, you have to stay faithful. And we need to stay faithful. I'm not promising that every single battle we ever come across is going to be some great victory. But we know how everything ends. And we need to keep uh, seeking the Lord and make sure that we're in the right fight, that we're, that we're fighting the way that we ought to be fighting. Right? They ask here, well, who should go up first? How, what's our plan? How are we going to do this? And we go to God for everything. Flip over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 26. Man, I'm way behind. There's a lot of scripture I want to cover this morning about prayer. This is just the, the tip of the iceberg. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, verse 20, Hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. So seeking counsel and seeking instruction from the Lord is going to make you wise. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. So when things happen, people can have a lot of ideas, right? You can have a lot of ideas in your heart that come to your mind. Like, oh, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do this. But it's the counsel of the Lord that's going to stand. That is the right counsel. That is the good wisdom that we should be seeking after is what does the Bible say? You know, people can hear about the, you know, this event or this attack and say, well, man, we should do this, 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 and this. Well, what does the Bible say we should do? What does God say we should do? That's going to stand. That's when you know, hey, we're solid in what we're doing. We're not just going to take all these matters in our own hands and just come up with all kinds of crazy things. Let's see what God says. And we're going to see many, 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 many times when people are involved in battles, especially battles farther away, you know what the right response is? Prayer. Prayer. Response for us, one of the big responses is prayer. And, and look, just because you don't physically see the results, especially immediately all the time, don't forego or forsake prayer. It requires time. It requires you to carve out time and seriously speak with the Lord. Now, I think we should always be praying in our hearts to God as much as possible. But oftentimes that can still be like you got a lot of things going on and you're kind of like trying to talk to God. Make sure you set aside time to go and pray to God where you're, you're giving him your full attention. It's not just enough to do the half attention while you're driving your car. Do it. Look, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I think you should do that. I do that. I try to pray to God a lot. But, you know, make sure you carve out a time where you're saying, okay, now I'm going to pray to God. Because God deserves that. God deserves that attention from you where you're going to pray to him and just, and just try to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, <clears throat> with the Lord. Jesus did this. You're in Matthew 26. We're going to start reading in verse number 36 where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. So when Jesus is facing his most trying hour on the earth, I mean, literally, right? He knows he's about to be arrested. He knows he's about to be, you know, go through everything that he ends up going through. He knows he's about to be crucified. So it's a, it's a very big event and it's not a pleasant event if you're in Jesus' shoes that I'm about to go through everything. The culmination of his ministry now is going to come to this point to where he has to shed his blood and die on the cross for mankind. Not something to be, you know, thrilled about and looking forward to doing. And right before this happens, what does he choose to do? There's a lot of things he can do. A lot of things he could choose to spend his time doing. And what does he choose to do? He chooses to pray unto the Father. This is what he does. This is how he prepares for the battle that he has right about to come up. Verse number 36, Then come at Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then say at the end of them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So he's saying, God, you know, if there's any way I can do this, you know, where you could just let this cup pass for me so I don't have to go through this. Please let, let, let that be the way that things go. But not according to my will, according to thy will. All right? and, and this is important. It's a great example for us in prayer. Uncomfortable situations we don't want to go through. 
right? So when things come up and when battles come up and we know, oh man, this is going to be a big battle, I don't want to do it, right? God, is there any way I don't have to go through this? There's nothing wrong in asking for that, but you know, we always have to remember, but God, whatever your will is, I I'm, I'm going to do it. God, can you help me out here? Is there something that we can do? Is there any way that, that we can make, you know, where I can still serve you and do everything you want me to do, but avoid this conflict or avoid this battle or not do things this way? And we keep the mindset that you still are seeking the Lord and, and His counsel and His will because that's what's going to stand. And, and you ask things while you're still maintaining what His will will be. Because at the end of the day, we should want to do God's will anyways, no matter what. Verse 40, let's keep reading here. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So now he's instructing, you know, not only is he praying, he's instructing his disciples that came with him. Hey, you watch and pray. Stay up here with me. I need you. You know, Jesus is facing this moment and he brings his closest disciples with him and say, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to go over there and pray. You guys stay here. Watch. You know, they're supposed to be the lookout for Jesus because he knows people are coming to arrest him. He's going to pray. He's like, hey, you watch here. They're supposed to be that midnight watch for him, watching over and praying for him, praying that God will strengthen him, praying for what he has to face. And he comes back and he finds him asleep. And he says, look, I know, you know, the, the, the spirit is willing. He knew that about his disciples. They wanted to help, but their flesh was weak. We need to make sure that, that we make our flesh weak and our spirit strong. So that way the flesh doesn't overtake us because watching and praying is still, you know, it's an important thing to do, especially during these hard times. Look at Jesus said in verse 442, he went away again the second time and prayed saying, oh my father, if the cup, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. So three times he's choosing. And then, and then of course after this is when Judas shows up with the soldiers and they arrest him and everything else. So this is the last thing that Jesus is doing right before his, his hours come. He's praying unto the Lord. He's praying unto God. He's praying unto the Father. Prayer is not in vain. It's powerful. And of course, Jesus knew this, which is why this is what he chooses to do right before he faces that, that hour. Jump down to verse number 51. This is when Peter, it just says here, Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. That was Peter. So Peter takes out his sword and cuts off this guy's ear. But look at what Jesus responds to him in verse number 52. It says, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that, that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So this battle, he's saying, this isn't a physical battle. You know, you take up the sword, you're going to die by the sword. He's even instructing Peter, you know, they came to him with swords and staves. Right? That's what they came to Jesus with. But Jesus tells Peter, hey, no, 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 no. No, we don't need, we're not getting in this fight. Because if, if he were going to get in that fight, look what he says in verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? He's saying if we needed to fight that kind of fight, what would he do? He, he says, we don't even need to draw our swords because I could just pray unto the father and he'll just bring me 12 legions of angels. You still wouldn't have to fight that physical battle because God can provide the angels. So he's rebuking Peter. He's saying, you think God wouldn't hear me and send me 12 legions of angels? Because he would. Let's take note of that when we pray to God for things. That's why I wasn't saying the thing about the angels in vain. You know, that is a good prayer to pray for. Pray that God, God, protect us with your angels. God, protect those out there. Protect the people. You know, the wicked are trying to do really bad things and trying to, you know, hurt people and, and scare people. Lord, protect them. If needs be, Lord, send your angels down there to make sure that they are safe, that they're protected. Flip over to James chapter number 5. James chapter number 5. 
another great passage. We're going to start reading verse number 13, James chapter 5, that, that tells us and explains how powerful prayer really is. They're not just empty words. When you're going and praying to the Lord, you're not just speaking into the air. You're praying to an almighty, all-powerful God that wants to hear from you that wants you to communicate with him, that wants you to rely on him, that wants you to trust in him completely and go to him with all of your cares and all of your wants and all of your needs. And he wants to hear from you asking for help for other people too. Especially likes to hear that. James 5 verse 13, the Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. So what does the Bible say to do when you're afflicted, when you're coming across persecution, when you are going through tribulation? Let him pray. When you're afflicted, let him pray. That's the Bible's response. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual. It has an effect. It actually does something. Fervent prayer. I mean, you're not just chanting empty words. I remember when I was younger, before I was saved, I didn't know anything. And, you know, I was, my grandfather died and I wanted to pray to God. And I didn't even know how to pray. So I started chanting the Lord's Prayer. That's not a very effective prayer. Because you're not really asking for much. I mean, when you just repeat something, it's not even from the heart. I didn't even know what I was saying. So even the things in that prayer that would be good, like, Lord, deliver us from evil and, and all these other things that are, that are good things to pray for, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't thinking about what it actually meant. I was just trying to pray. And that's, that's what a lost person does. They don't know how to pray. But look, we need to have fervent prayer with the Lord. Fervent, you're not going to have fervent prayer if it's not coming from your heart. If you're not investing the time and calling out to God and, and thinking, like, you know, I, I need to be praying about these things, these things are serious. It, it's not just, and, and remember this for next week when we start the prayer challenge too, we're not just checking off a box. Okay, don't do the challenge if you just want to check off a box. Just, okay, I prayed. Take the time and invest the time and make the prayer work and make the prayer happen and, and have your heart in your prayer to the Lord. So you can have an effectual, fervent prayer unto God. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When you're listening to God and being obedient and you're righteous in his eyes because you're listening to him and following him, he's going to be a lot more likely to listen to you. And I've explained this before. It's the same way when you have kids you have a kid that's just always disobedient, never listening to what you're saying, and then they come to you and ask you for things, you are way less likely to give them what they're asking for when they have no care to listen to you at all. But when you have a child that's being good and listening, and you know, they're not perfect, but they're trying their best to try to, to please you and do what you want, and then they ask you for something, sure. I mean, you love them. You want, you want to give them the things that they're asking you for, right? It's the same way with God. So if we want to help other people, let's make sure we're listening to the Lord and obeying Him so that He'll hear us. And let's have that effectual, fervent prayer because it does avail as much. And then the next verse explains another example of where it does avail much, where we can see a, a, a great illustration of prayer working. In verse number 17, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Hey, Elijah was just like you or me. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He was just a regular man. Nothing special about him. He's a normal guy. And he prayed unto the Lord that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. We talk about having power with God. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And you know what? God hearkened to his prayer. God listened to him. That alone is an amazing thought. That we have a God that will listen and, and, and perform those types of miracles because a man is asking.
when we pray, pray in faith, knowing, knowing you're speaking, you know, God is real. God is hearing you and is able to do anything. And when we're thinking about others, I mean, what else could they need? If God's going to be able to step in and do things, we don't, you know, you don't need anything else. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 17. I'm going to read from Luke 18 for you. I'm going to try to get through some of these scriptures. Because the Bible talks about prayer so much. Preparing a sermon about praying, and even just specifically on like these battles and these hard times that you're facing in regard to prayer, it's not oh, where, wh how much can I find about this? Is What am I going to leave out? There's so much in the Bible about prayer. It, this, this should be so integrated in your life. I hope it is. I hope prayer is an integral part of your life. If it's not, make it integral in your life. Make the time for it. It's, wor it's worth it for you, for your sake. It's worth it. Don't just blow past it as, eh, whatever. When I get around to it, I'll do it. I'm going to read for you from Luke 18. You're in John 17. You can say there, Luke 18, the Bible says in verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So Jesus is going to tell a parable and to the end, to the whole purpose, is that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Bible says, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. So there was just wicked judge, right? And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So we've got this wicked judge. He doesn't care about what's right. He doesn't care about anything. He just cares about himself. And this woman's coming to him saying, Look, you know, wrong was done to me. Avenge me. Because that's the judge's job, right? To bring forth justice. She's going to the judge. You bring me justice. I need justice. I need justice. And he just says, like, you know what? This, if I don't do something about this, this woman's going to keep coming back to me, and I'm sick of hearing about it, so I'm just going to do something about it anyway. So this is an unjust judge, right? But Jesus gives this example, and he's saying, look, if the unjust judge is going to listen because this woman keeps coming back, in requesting and asking and praying that he would do something about this. He explains this here, verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. So he's saying, you know, even the unjust judge will end up doing something because this woman keeps coming back. He's saying, how much more will God, the Father, hear his own children, hear his own elect when you go to him? He says, he will judge, he will avenge speedily. So these, these wicked people that are, that are bringing forth physical attacks and threatening harm and doing things like that, you know what? We could pray to the judge to avenge. We don't have to take that matter in our own hands. Let's let God deal with it. Because God will judge. And you know what? We know that God's going to judge righteously too. And that whatever he decides to do will be appropriate and will be right. But Jesus said this whole parable so that we would always pray and not faint, I mean, not stop, right? Don't give up praying. Just like the woman wanted to seek justice and she kept going to the judge. Hey, when we have problems, we have issues, don't stop praying. Let's keep going to God for them. You're in John chapter 17. We have another great example here with Jesus where he prays for his disciples. And, and, I, and well, let's just read, let's get into it before I get ahead of myself. Verse number six, the Bible reads, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So he's talking about his disciples, right? They, they're, they're given unto Jesus, and they've kept his word. Verse seven, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. 
That statement that Jesus makes there, he's saying, you know what? I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for them, though. I'm praying for them that believe. I'm praying for them that are keeping your word. I'm praying for them. This is who Jesus is spending his time praying for. Now, now look, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's not saying that he didn't love the world and that he doesn't want the world to come to him and he doesn't want the world to be saved. It's not what he's saying here. But he is saying that he's not just spending his time praying for the world. He already made the sacrifice, or he's going to make the sacrifice in this sense, but he's already done that. He's already made the sacrifice. He's already demonstrated his love. He's already showed that. But he's saying, you know what? I'm going to take my time and I'm going to pray for these people. There's a special place in Jesus' heart for his saints, for his elect. Okay, and we need to take that special time too and pray for the saints and pray for the elect and, and pray for them. I'm not saying it's wrong that you pray that someone you know might get saved, that you know, pray for the lost, but he's not just praying for the world as a whole. You know, I'm praying for these people specifically. I'm praying for these that believe. I'm praying for these that, that are keeping your word. Jump down to verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And this is the prayer that Jesus made unto the Father. He's saying, you know what? I'm praying for them. I want you to keep them from the evil. They need to be in the world. And the world, you know what? The world hates them. The world's going to hate them and mock them and do things to them like they're doing to me. He's saying, I don't want you just to take them out of the world. They need to be in the world. It's necessary for people to be in the world. It's necessary for us to be in the world that we can preach the gospel. But the prayer is that keep them from the evil. Lord, keep them from being destroyed. And this is a prayer that we ought to make as well. This is a follow Jesus example. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 12. We're going to see another example of, of the power of prayer when persecution comes, when persecution arises. Acts chapter 12, verse number 5, the Bible reads, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, this isn't in there by mistake or by accident. You know, Peter gets, gets tossed into prison, which was happening, I, I don't know how frequently, but relatively frequently with the apostles, right? They keep on getting arrested and cast in prison. But you know what? The church, obviously they didn't, they didn't form a prison break. They didn't say, okay, Peter's in prison, here's the plan. All right, and they get the A team together and they're going to get the big van and they're gonna, we're going to drive through the fence, right? We're going to come out shooting, guns a-blazing, and we're going to get Peter and we're going we're to take him with us and drive off. That wasn't the plan, right? No, the plan was prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Okay, Peter's in trouble. Okay, he was facing, you know, he's in prison. That warrants you to take time out of your schedule to spend extra time in prayer for him. And the church says, you know what, we're going to pray for Peter. He's in prison, let's pray for him. It worked. Because God sends his angel to come down and God does the prison break. Which worked way better than if they would have tried to take it into their own hands and do their own prison break, right? Let God do it. And verse number 11 says, And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people. You see, the Jews wanted to kill him. And Herod was going to leave him in there because he saw that it pleased the Jews and he was just a, this stinking politician that just wants to please the people or whatever, this, his voting block, and make them happy. Verse 12 says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So they're praying, 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 praying for Peter, and guess what? God delivers him. God sets him free. What a great victory. Doing what they can do through prayer. But notice that he came to the house where they were still praying. They didn't just say, oh, I need to pray for Peter. Oh, God, please uh, help Peter, help him get out of prison. Okay, thanks, amen. Okay, 
serious. That's not that. Look, you may get used to praying like that. You need to invest more time speaking to God. I mean, first and foremost, don't forget who you're talking to. This is, what, this is what I'm referring to when I was talking about just checking off the box. Right? Oh, I prayed today. Dear Lord, just, uh, bless the food of my body. Okay, thanks. But, you know, like saying a prayer as fast as you can just to say that you prayed to God. Treat God first and foremost with the respect of being God Almighty and communicating with the Lord in heaven with respect. Which is why when we, you know, when we pray here in church and I teach my children to pray at home, we bow our heads and close our eyes. Why? Because we're going to be humble before our Lord. I'm not saying it's the only way to pray, but what I'm saying is we're trying to remember and do things that are going to keep us humble. I demand silence at my house when we pray. No one's allowed to just get up and, oh, I got to go to the bathroom and, oh, I got to do this. Look, we're taking the time and we're praying to the Lord. It's a serious time. Okay? And we're going to God and we're going we're gonna to talk to God and, and tell Him our needs. And, and um, you know, just because God knows your thoughts, the Bible still commands us that we ought to be praying. You know, tell, you know, that is evident that God wants us to pray to Him even though He knows our needs. He wants us to pray to Him anyways. So don't just think, oh, God already knows. Go to Him in prayer. Prayer works. Turn if you to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'm going to read for you from Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 is a chapter that gives you that the, you know, I was talking about the armor of God. Earlier I was talking about being a soldier, right? The armor of God, it talks about the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, right? And your loins girt about with truth and your feet shod with the preparation of gospel of peace and all these different pieces of equipment, you know, so to speak, right? Using the, uh, the illustration of being armor, but, but how we ought to be prepared for battle, for God's spiritual battle. And then after it goes through that, that um, you know, just defining the armor of God, verse 18, I'll just read this for you. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So right after, it's talking about girding yourself with the armor of God. The very next thing, saying, and you know what? Pray always with all prayer and supplication and be praying for all saints. We need to be thinking about other people and praying for other saints and praying for other people who are in these battles. I mean, over and over again, there's so much support in Scripture. It says, you know, what should we be doing? We need to be praying to God. We need God's hand in this. Anything that we decide that we think we're going to do out of a thought and counsel of our own heart is not going to stand. But you know what? God's counsel will stand. And you know what? The world may mock and the world may laugh. And the sodomites hear the sermon, oh yeah, go ahead, pray to your God, right? And they're going to joke and, and, and rail and make fun of you. But you know what? There's nothing new. They're blasphemers of the Lord anyways. They hate the God. They could keep hating God. But you know what? We know that he's real. We know that he's there. We know that he hears. We know that he listens. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And you know what? Maybe someone will learn to fear the Lord. Because even through events like this, especially through events like this, maybe other people can see the hand of God in things and go, wow. I'm not going to mess with them or whatever, right? Because God's hand is in this. Romans 15, look at verse number 30. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He's asking the Romans, say, hey, stri work, strive with me in prayer. Because he's praying unto God. You better believe that as he's in prison. And he's saying, pray with me. Work with me in this work, praying. Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. The Apostle Paul, as he's facing persecution, what's he doing with, with, with the people that love him? He's asking them to pray. Pray for me. Pray with me. He's praying. He's suffering persecution. What's he doing? He's praying. 
What's he doing? He's asking other people to pray with him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, last place I'll have you turn. Well, there's one more reference. You could turn it if you want. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, almost done here. Verse number 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Bob reads, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Being delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. That's what we want, right? So how do we do that? Let's pray. Let's pray to God. Pray for God's deliverance. Pray for God to help. Pray for God to step in. That is how you can be a great warrior in the faith. Staying faithful. Don't back down. Don't, don't give any way and any room to the bully sodomite children of the devil that are trying to, to push their wicked agenda. Stay strong and stay in prayer. Devote your time to pray for other people. And you know what? Who cares if anyone knows if you're praying for them or not? That doesn't matter because God's the one that hears it and God's the one who's going to step in anyways. Don't pray just to be seen of men. That's what the Pharisees do. That's right. No one ever needs to know how much you pray. Only God. Now, there's nothing wrong with letting people know you're praying for them because it is a form of encouragement. But don't ever tell someone you're praying for them and, don't, and not actually praying for them. You tell someone you're going to pray for them, you pray for them. Okay? Go ahead, tell them you're encouraging them, but everyone doesn't need to know. The best thing you can do is take the time, though. Take the time. Not just some quick 30-second prayer. Take the time and pray. Really pray to the Lord. We get a head start on our prayer challenge, and you know what? Hopefully it's just going to be part of your life. And saying, Pastor Burgess, that's not a challenge at all. 20 minutes? Of course I pray 20 minutes to the Lord every day. There's actually someone mentioned in the Bible that was known for their prayers. And that's in Colossians 4. You don't have to turn if you want. Colossians 4.12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. There's someone being commended for their prayer. Man, like, man, this guy is praying fervently for you all, that you could stand, that you can be complete in all the will of God. Do you think the Bible is going to talk about prayer so much? And this is barely scratching the surface. The Bible is going to talk so much about prayer if, well, it's really not that big of a deal anyways. No, my friends, this is, this is part of the spiritual battle. It's a big part of the spiritual battle. Communicating with the Lord. Going to God and, and going to the Lord as your defense, as your counselor, as your instructor, as, as, you know, for everything. Pray for others. That's why, that, that's why we have a prayer. This is, you know, going back to, to how we do things in this church, and I said Jesus Christ is the head, and we're trying to do everything the way that God would have us to do things. We keep a list of people that we need to pray for because prayer is so important. Take the, don't, don't just toss the list aside. Take it home with you and pray for those people. It's our duty. It's our job. We ought to be praying unto God for those people. Think about it this way. When you have your time of need, when you're suffering persecution, when people are coming after you, when you have your health problems, how much do you want to have the people that are righteous and serving the Lord praying for you? How much are you going to covet their prayers then? You want that? Well, then why don't you take the time now when you're not in need and pray for other people that are in need? Don't forsake prayer. So vital to the spiritual warfare that we're in. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for hearing us. Thank you for instructing us, dear Lord. We thank you for um, just leading us and guiding us. God, we, we want to pray, especially tonight, we want to pray for those at First Works Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you would please embolden them and strengthen them and give Pastor Mejia wisdom and knowledge and, and light their path, dear Lord. We pray that you would please protect them, that you would just in, you know, compass them about with, with your angels and that you would 
um, keep them from evil, Lord, and, and help them to do a greater work. And, and Lord, that the attention that's being brought to this would only bring honor and glory unto your name and that, and that many more people will be reached and souls saved as a result of this event. Lord, help them all to stay strong in the faith. And God, um, we, we pray that you would please just hear us and hear our prayers and um, that we would also know and, and, and understand what all we can do to help them and to be able to make sure that we're also prepared to stand in the day of battle. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.